The nomenclature for aromatic compounds is really quite straightforward. That's the good news. The bad news is that there are a few structures you absolutely must memorize because these structures turn up in the common names and the systematic approach to naming also uses these same names. Take a look at these key monocyclic aromatic compounds. You're already expecting the first one would be benzene. It's a hydrocarbon, six-membered ring, nothing to it. When a methyl group was on there, we call it toluene. And when we put a vinyl group on there, we call it styrene. The substituents on the benzene ring can have heteroatoms, such as nitrogen or oxygen. This is aniline. This is phenol. And a cousin to phenol that has a methoxy group there is called anisole. Some aromatics have carbonyl groups attached directly to the ring. The key ones are benzaldehyde, benzoic acid, acetophenone. Notice that for your use, I've put some of these in blue boxes. And if it turns out that you find that you can only memorize a few of these guys, the, memorize the ones in the blue boxes. Benzene, toluene, aniline, phenol, benzaldehyde, benzoic acid are the central key players that you really must know. It will be helpful to know styrene, anisole, and acetophenone, but they don't prop up nearly as much. There are three dimethylbenzenes. We call them xylene. And the ortho, meta, and para designations tell you the relationship between the two methyl groups. Ortho is a designation that means adjacent carbons. Meta is a designation that means that they'll have one carbon between the two groups. And para is the designation for substituents that are directly opposite each other. There are a few key polycyclic aromatic compounds, compounds that have more than one aromatic ring. Naphthalene has two rings that share a side, like Siamese twins. The compound that has three rings with two shared sides is called anthracene. And if those three rings share sides in a different way, we have a compound called phenanthrene. I've written it two different ways here. This is exactly the same structure. Notice that of the compounds I put on the screen, naphthalene is in the blue box. You absolutely must learn the structure of naphthalene. And notice there are only two different types of carbons in naphthalene that can have substituents. One is adjacent to the fused rings. We call this the one position or alpha. And the other carbon is the carbon next to that one. We call that the two position or beta. The alpha and beta designations are considered common nomenclature, while the numbers are used for IUPAC systematic nomenclature. The rings of all the compounds we've seen so far have nothing but carbon in them, but it's possible to have oxygen or nitrogen in those rings. Take a look. Here's a compound called pyridine. Very common, extensively used. One of the carbon with the hydrogen is gone, and the nitrogen is in its place. Here's a compound that has nitrogen in the ring, and it's five-membered ring. It's called pyrrol. We'll talk about why we consider this to be aromatic, even though it doesn't have alternating single double bonds all the way around the ring. You can have two nitrogens in that ring. This is a really important compound biologically. It's called imidazole. It's a very important base because of its pKa, pKb values and along with parole, is widely found in biological materials, including the catalytic sites of enzymes. And here's an oxygen example called furan. You see, I put blue boxes around all of these. To be frank, not all teachers would say you need to memorize these structures, but I know many of you are interested in biology. They'll, it'll pop up again in biochemistry and on the MCAT. So knowing pyridine, pyrrole, imidazole, and furan will be really helpful. We looked at monosubstituted benzenes. Let's look at some disubstituted benzenes. There are two ways to name these guys. We can call these by their common names, xylene, and I've already mentioned the ortho, meta, and para relationships. That's very important. Those designations are usually used when we have two substituents on the benzene ring. We can use numbers, but almost always we use the ortho, meta, and para designations. Here's an example. We'll look carefully at this disubstituted compound and notice that it has a methyl group attached to the benzene ring. That makes it a toluene. We could name this as a disubstituted benzene, but we won't. We'll name this as a toluene that has one substituent on it. 
And because that substituent is on the adjacent carbon next to the methyl, we'll call it orthobromotoluene. If we want to use systematic nomenclature, we'll call it 2-bromotoluene. We don't need to put the 1 for the methyl group because we know toluene has a methyl group there and that's always carbon number 1. This is better bromophenol. Again, we've looked carefully at the substituents on the benzene ring and notice there's a hydroxyl group attached to the benzene, which makes this a phenol. It's a substituted phenol. It has one substituent. So we'll call it metabromophenol because there's one carbon between the two substituents. Or if we want to use the IUPAC system, we'll call it 3-bromophenol. We'll number again with number one where the hydroxyl group is. That's understood and we don't say it. And we'll go to carbon number two. And as we move around the ring, we'll get to carbon number three where the nitro group is. Here's a third example. This is para-isopropyl benzoic acid. Again, we've noticed that there's a carboxyl group attached directly to the benzene ring, which is defined as benzoic acid. You see why I told you you need to memorize the names of those structures? Because the isopropyl group is directly across the ring from the carboxyl group, it's para-isopropyl benzoic acid. Or in IUPAC nomenclature, We'll start counting with carbon number one, where the carboxyl group is, and go around the ring until we get to the isopropyl group. Here's some more examples of disubstituted compounds that don't have special names. These disubstituted compounds all are named as benzenes, and we'll put the substituents in alphabetical order. So for the first one, here on the left, we'll call it orthochloronitrobenzene. It's ortho because the two substituents are on adjacent carbons. In the systematic nomenclature, we'll call this 1-chloro-2-nitrobenzene. We number the chloro-1 because it's first in the name. The middle structure is meta-difluorobenzene in our common nomenclature. There's one carbon separating the two substituents. In the IUPAC nomenclature, we would call this 1,3-difluorobenzene. We'll name the structure on the right para-bromoethylbenzene as a common name, or with the systematic nomenclature, we'll call it 1-bromo-4-ethylbenzene. So the disubstituted benzenes have two types of names. They're both pretty straightforward. Let's look at some examples when we have three substituents and we'll have to use the systematic nomenclature. When you have more than two substituents, you can't use the ortho, meta, and para designations. You have to use numbers. Again, the first thing you'll do is take a look to see if this is one of the special structures whose names you've memorized. And looking at the blue atoms, you can see that, yes, this is a phenol. So we're going to name this compound as a phenol. We'll number going in the direction around the ring to get it to a substituent soonest, and we'll put the substituents in alphabetical order in the name. Let's name this guy. This is a phenol. We'll put the substituents in alphabetical order. So bromo comes first and then nitro. And we'll put the numbers on to show where the substituents are. To number the ring, we'll think of this as carbon number one, going in the direction that gets to a substituent quickest. So this is 4-bromo, 2-nitrophenol. Let's do one more example. Now when we look at this, we don't see any special structure in here. It's simply a benzene. It's a tri-substituted benzene. We'll put the substituents in alphabetical order, bromo, fluoro, iodo. Now we're going to start with the number one carbon as being bromine because it's first and we don't have a special structure. We'll go in the direction where we get to the substituent quickest. This is one bromo, four fluoro. 3-iodobenzene. Notice, by the way, that I've written each of these structures twice, just to show you that orientation doesn't matter at all. We would get the same name if we had an orientation like this. We would have carbon number one is the phenol hydroxyl, 2-nitro, 4-bromo. And down here, we'd number the bromocarbon as one, so we'd get the same name. And there you have it. If you apply the rule systematically, and use those names you've memorized when you see special structures in the molecule, you'll find that naming these things with IUPAC names is quite simple, whether you have three, four, or more substituents.